Okay, uh, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to our annual MTech lecture. Actually that makes it sound as though we only have one a year. Um, but we try and treat this on the in Mark Jury Day as kind of special lecture. And I'm very happy to, to welcome Mark Sarkissian. Uh, Mark's been involved increasingly with us over the last two or three years, I think in San Francisco three years ago for a couple of years, a PhD by design program and with MTech. Um, if I can spare his blushes for a moment. He's a very distinguished engineer. Um, his discipline and his influence is far wider than just structural engineering, but that's his core discipline for which he's published over 100 papers. He has 50 awards for innovation, uh, my favorite of which, which I don't know if we'll see tonight, is the um, hyperbolic paraboloid walls uh, that incorporate in the structure of a 400 plus meter tower. I don't know if that's being shown tonight. Um, but tonight he's going to talk to us about interconnectedness, how any single building is embedded in the systems of a city and is part of a, a wider ecology. So please join me in welcoming Mark Sarkissian. Well, Michael, that was overly kind. I, I, I appreciate uh, your comments. I, I, um, I'll say it's a work in progress, and, and um, it's a wide range of interests, and some of those interests we'll share tonight. Um, I, I think that uh, the influence of the city and how it affects architecture and engineering is very important, and I think that there are clues uh, to this, many of which were talked about today um, in some of the presentations and how we look forward to uh, developing these, these ideas into the built environment. Um, it's about a relationship with the ground and, and how we, we think about cities and architecture and engineering and, and how it relates locally and broadly uh, in terms of development. It's the idea of structure and whether structure is permanent or temporary. And, and the idea of cities and how we relate to the urban context, how we develop cities in a way um, with great responsibility of, as we look forward, um, responsibility to the environment, res res social responsibilities, <laughs> use of materials. All these things are, are very important as we plan and go forward. And I, th I think some of the techniques that were talked about today in terms of developing um, a broader sense of algorithms that, are, that, that can be used to, to predict what I think is probably most important, that's the evolution of the city rather than the first idea for the city. I think that, that projects relate in different ways around the world. Uh, but most importantly, I think that they're they're, they're in need of being embraced by a local culture um, and, and opportunities that get introduced into structures that help to activate spaces um, through some very basic forms. Uh, moods can change based on um, a graphic response that's important uh, to that particular setting. There are formal approaches that have been very successful. U.S. Air Force Academy um, a response uh, that is about 60 years old now, but one that sustained. It was an idea that worked. But I wonder if, as we go forward, if it's a much um, less defined approach to the planning of cities. In 2002, there was a study done in Amsterdam where people were given GPS devices for one week. And they were tracked. So you could watch their movements without actually being part of the, the experiment. And what I found really interesting was that there was a definition that was forced upon the, the, the people that were involved with the experiment, movements through roads and predefined, predefined roads and predefined walkways 
that made us wonder about the spaces in between and whether or not those spaces were just as important as the paths that these people follow. So when we think about our structures and architecture and we think about the rigorous moves that we create to define architecture and structure, column lines and beam lines and things that are our first response as we go to build these buildings, the question is, what about the spaces in between? What does it mean to be between those lines and how can we use those spaces whether it's on a vertical surface or a horizontal surface. Um, in the Netherlands in 2004, there was a study that was done uh, based on a, a question that was asked every day of the inhabitants of, of this small town. And the response was gauged um, to a mood. So uh, red would mean a feeling of love. Uh, green, in this case, a feeling of hate. Uh, yellow, for instance, a feeling of fear, but it was a way for people to interact with one another without uh, being directly associated with them. So it's, it, it's an indirect relationship in cities that I think is very important for us. So I could experience the mood of this place by watching this fairly nondescript object uh, over time, um, and I could interact in that way uh, rather than directly. I couldn't, I, for instance, I, I may not even answer the questions that that were asked for that particular day. Um, this relationship in the vertical plane, the vertical uh, volume is very important. And as we, we further densify our cities, I wonder about the social interactions that happen in forms like this. Um, being close to your neighbor, uh, at the street level perhaps, and also um, in, in areas that are well above the street level. So these are experiments that I think that are important for us to, to consider when we develop our cities. We're faced with a daunting task, um, and that's the change in the, the climate, the change in our environment. Um, it's affecting all of us, and whether or not you believe in climate change or not, um, it's an issue that I believe is very important for us to face in design. Over the last 100 years, the the Earth's temperature has changed by an average of about a, a degree and a half Fahrenheit. And looking forward, we, we see probably a two degree change in temperature. Um, we were asked uh, to be part of a competition in the Bay Area for the effects of sea level rise. Um, and, and there were about 130 or so submissions. Most of the submissions would be, they, they, were, they, they were what you would expect. The idea that if we had sea level rise, you would either build on structures that were on the water, or you would raise structures that were along the coastline, or you would move away altogether. Um, but what we were looking at was an opportunity to, to look at the source. And in the Bay Area, there's a, there's a throat that exists that many of you know, the Golden Gate Bridge. And our approach was to identify the problem, correct the problem before it affected this large uh, area. And you know, we're looking at predicted sea level rises, including tidal surges, about two meters in about 50 years. Now, whether you believe it or not, I think that a portion of this is already happening. We're seeing it in different cities around the world. So as a, pro, as a, as a reactive um, response, we looked at the, the, the existing infrastructure and how we perhaps could use that infrastructure to deal with the sea level rise and the surge um, of, of, of tides that occasionally would happen over, over the year. It, it was a response that looked at the, the bay, looked at the geometry um, of, of the bed uh, of the bay near the bridge, and it looked at means at which you could passively uh, use energy that exists through wave action to compress air and use that compressed air to create a buoyant system that at times could be deployed and designed to resist those surges, protect the bay a few times a year. That's what we were predicting. Um, it's, it's more about surges at that point than, than, than pure sea, sea level rise. So this structure, this very lightweight structure, was informed by the bridge, and it was a, it was a reaction to what I think is, is a real problem for us. So in its, its final temporary deployed case, um, as everybody knows, marine life and, 
and, and commercial traffic is very important to this area. So this is a temporary system that could be used uh, when predicted events would, would happen. In looking at these uh, problems, I, I think our, our uh, response, the responsibility that we have is to think more holistically about our environment and, and how we are going to deal with issues of global warming from the source rather than reacting to um, the problems after they're already in place. Um, and, and ideas that think about uh, cities in harsh uh, climates, we saw a project today that looked at this as well. Um, idea of, of creating uh, stratification of uses throughout um, the development where you have public and private spaces. Um, but, but very importantly, looking at the placement of these structures um, in the landscape and what the exposure uh, to this, these projects are and how, what becomes our greatest leading and most weighted parameter when we think about the analysis of these forms and the placement of these forms. So it's, it, it, it's about controlling, in this case, temperature, but coming up with systems that are elegant, efficient, um, and, and can be built. So uh, ideas when, when dealing with these complicated forms, you, you, you have to almost look for opportunities in between. And for instance, vertical transportation and so forth still needs to happen within these complex forms. So the overlapping um, of, 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 of uh, surfaces create other opportunities for us to insert things, practical things like stairs and elevators and so forth within the volume. Really, it's, it, it's rooted in experimentation uh, of those forms and how we uh, create rational responses and control what we're set out to do. Um, in, in this case, temperature. Uh, this is a proposal for a project in the Middle East where um, these types of spaces uh, needed to be controlled, but daylight was still important. So daylight, indirect daylight, we talked a little bit about this today. Uh, needed to be considered as, as part of the design. So modeling is very important, um, both from the, the, I'll say the more uh, rational or mathematical side and then the physical side, looking at velocities of, uh, of air and air flow, and then very importantly, temperature and the effect of the climate at the place where people will use uh, these structures most. And, and in these graphs, the, the blue lines are, are the surface temperatures that would exist at the ground plane if these structures didn't exist. And the yellow line is the effect of, of these structures being placed so that the heat effects are controlled. We've got and we'll continue to get a huge amount of data from development. Okay, And it's, it's anything from um, data that we're transferring uh, amongst ourselves to information that buildings perhaps have and can have in the future. Um, and it's about taking and thinking about the built environment as it exists and, and how it evolves over time and how can we uh, consider these developments and consider this data in our designs. Um, in San Francisco, we, uh, we built uh, essentially the entire city digitally. And what's interesting is that there's a lot of information that exists that's of public record, but it's basic information. So things like um, construction type for buildings, when buildings were built, um, so you could correlate to codes and so forth um, in terms of what they were designed for, uh, areas of, of building, lot area and so forth, and orientation of course on the site is all known. So what we did is we took that data and we looked at the city and we assigned uh, in, in the white color to projects that were not built yet, were, con were conceived of um, in a very preliminary way that had least, the least amount of data, least amount of information that was associated with it. To the projects that, were, that are shown in red that have the most information. They have information down to um, the, the fenestrations of the exterior wall system, the exact placement on the site, the very exact height of the building. Um, and, and so we can take this data and look at cities in a way um, that, uh, that, that, that is smart, that has, that has tagged uh, 
um, ideas that are already associated with them, and, and we can take this, this tagging, this, these ideas that exist, that are embedded, and we can look at things like views on the top right. We can look at things like um, uh, planning guidelines of, of height throughout the city, and if you notice, there are several buildings in San Francisco that have violated the planning code over time, believe it or not. Uh, it's actually really hard to believe given how difficult it is to build buildings in San Francisco. Um, but uh, also things like the wind and climate and, sh and, and sun and shadow. So all of these things are right, they're available right away when we conceive of these projects. But it's the environment that overlays on top of all this. And, and I'll argue that, that things are happening quickly around us in terms of, of, of what we're doing uh, to the environment. And, and I, I would argue that some of these effects are perhaps um, irreparable. So, you know, we, we, as we look forward to uh, the climate and, and the actual state of our environment, we need to think about ways of incorporating them into, into our designs. We're currently designing uh, a building in San Francisco. It's a developer project, uh, very sort of uh, hard-nosed in terms of its design. The geometry is very straightforward. The floor plan is very straightforward. The structure is very straightforward. Um, but what we did is we took that fairly straightforward structure and we, we looked at, instead of on the vertical plane, we looked at it on the horizontal plane in terms of optimizing the force flow within the floor. So how can you take this otherwise very simple geometric idea and come up with something that's very sophisticated in terms of its response? Looking for areas that um, have high stress, greater demand, and areas that our debtor zones where structure, in fact, needs to be there, but it doesn't need to be as robust. And the idea that perhaps there are cells that are introduced into the structural system so that you displace areas, displace material and area uh, of that material that's not required for the primary structure, but in a way that's sophisticated and in a way that responds directly to those flows that I showed you. But maybe it's a, a step further, and the idea might be that we use materials that are otherwise going to end up in the landfill. And, um, you know, the, the uh, I have a, a pop, actually. This guy here, everybody's probably uh, had this in the past, this is bottled water, right? So believe it or not, the idea came from um, the concept that when you, when you drink the water out of these and you recycle them, which a lot of us think we do. You put the cap back on it, and it traps air, right? That trapped air, when you try to when you try to compress a plastic water bottle, only can be compressed a certain amount, and, and you can actually calculate it. And the idea was that what if you could use the plastic water bottle, not just throw it into the structure, but place it in a way that was engineered, gathered, and engineered so that it took up space where you didn't need concrete. And for those of you that studied structure, you'll find that, especially in two-way slab systems and some long-span systems, a lot of the concrete's not even needed. It's there just because that's how we build it, and we just pour the slabs, and, and, and that material goes along for the ride. It creates additional mass, additional seismic demand. If we're able to, to be smart about what's around us, and and treat it in a way and place it in a way, engineer it in a way that reduces mass and reduces the material, the effects on the environment will be reduced. So, you, you know, you could take this crazy idea of the water bottle and you can, um, you can create these blocks out of, out of the plastics. Um, and, you, you know, you, you have to come up with a way that, that's practical and, and something that um, can be mass produced. But if you're to do this for this building, which is nominally a 30-story building, you can save a lot of material. You know, 20 miles we calculated of sidewalk, or of reinforcing steel, you could, you could make a thousand cars out of it. So these are the kinds of metrics that people get. They understand them, and I think it's important for us to take these sort of advanced ideas and boil them down into something that, 
a client or a user can say, you know, that makes a lot of sense and I want to do that. And it should be a requirement when I talk about the design of buildings. It's not just cost and time, but it's what the effect is when I build it. Now you could take this a step further and you can, you can develop it into things like uh, uh, reconstituted or, or reconditioned or reshaped uh, styrofoam mixed with mortar, create these tiles that are not as light but do a similar job and can be mass produced. Um, we were talking about some cities around the world. Um, there's some creative ideas out there about how do you deal with air quality, right? So tall buildings perhaps provide an opportunity to reach into upper uh, areas outside of the boundary zone of cities to capture clean air and bring that clean air down into the, uh, into the urban setting. And, and maybe these avenues, these conduits are dual purpose, so it's, 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 it's about moving air and material, but it's also about structure and perhaps the architecture. So these are the things that we're thinking about, and I think it's important um, to do that. It's going to be slow to come, um, but it, it, is, it is a response, and I'll argue that in addition to those kind of bigger moves, we, we should look at the more finite moves that we introduce into our work and that's the minimal use of material and, and trying to understand how forces flow through these structures um, and perhaps control daylight and heat gain at the same time. It can be done. It's a lot of work. Um, it's, it's, uh, when you look at a structure like this to, to engineer those spindly columns is, is a lot of work to make sure that that structure is stable. It can be done and the point is that I think it's important for us to think about our designs in a way that, that we, achieve, we achieve this. Um, you know, a lot of you have looked at nature and we are very interested in natural forms and as we dissect different elements of, of nature, we look for, for opportunities of efficiency um, and we look at um, the idea of infilling systems. So you have stronger mega systems that perhaps could be infilled with um, these smaller elements that are, that are proportionally placed, and in this case at 120 degrees, like the wing of the dragonfly, so that every single element within the system is essentially, um, uh, is, 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 a sense, is, is essentially resisting tension or compression. Okay, so what you want to do in all of your structures, if you can eliminate bending in elements, you've won because bending uh, is, is it's inefficient to resist. So the goal for us, whether it's a tall building or a short building, is, is how do we come up with systems that, that in fact are, are subjected only to axial tension and, and compression. Uh, so these are, these are investigations that we think are important in terms of, of, of how this response can be applied to something that's quite tall, for instance. It can be more sophisticated, you know, the idea that uh, that, that we use genetic algorithms to, to take random variables and look at things like orientation of, of bracing with, with an applied load and, and what that orientation means over the height of these structures. And it will mean that the, that the response is different than what we're used to. And, and there's an interpretation of that, uh, that analytical response to a practical response in terms of what we would perhaps introduce into our structures. So it's a path, um, I think, that, that helps us in making decisions, although those decisions are not necessarily perfect. Um, we, um, we've, we've gotten involved with some complicated forms. Um, uh, in this case, a, a, a 360 meter tall tower in Dubai. Uh, the idea that the entire perimeter of the structure is column free, um, that, that, that we use cables to support all of the occupied spaces. So under gravity load, it's clear um, what, what loads will be resisted. But under lateral loads, it's unclear. So what we asked ourselves was, what's the cable size? What's the orientation of the cable in terms of its inclination? And what is its spacing? And how can we come up with um, the most efficient idea? So we looked at this concept of a cellular structure. So the bones of the idea are based on a combination of, of, of structural elements that are placed next to one another and interconnected. 
with one another. And in terms of, uh, in terms of their relationship, perhaps it's reinforced concrete that we use that gathers these, these cellular <laughs> forms. The entire 12 meter diameter cell at the perimeter is column free, as I mentioned, with cables only at, at the perimeter. So we use genetics to, to, to look at um, three, really three variables, the cable diameter, the cable slope, and the cable spacing. And we used a, 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 fi a, a, a fitness function approach to, to look at the weighting of, of, of these, three, um, the, these, these three variables. And the most important thing for us was to control building drift by using least material, okay? And you'll see that the response is not even across the height of the building. And I think for us, it, it's important that in order to build something like this, we have to come up with systems that can be pulled across directly to construction, rather than through this conventional approach that many of us are used to today, which is we draw it, perhaps three-dimensionally, we hand it to somebody, they draw it again, uh, and then they produce it. But I think that the, the, the systems are, are far more advanced and, and, and we're on the verge of implementing these things. And members, for, for instance, would necessarily be straight, they might be curved uh, to achieve these more complex geometries. So a three-dimensional view of what this might be in terms of cable, geometry, relationship of the cells to the core, and then the final concept. I think that, that looking at structures in real time is important. Um, the compression, if I had to compare compression to tension, compression's bad. So the, the, the more that I can use tension in structures, the least amount of material, least effect on the environment. And, and these forms can, can be created so that they're not necessarily occupied, um, but they may be place, used for placemaking. Um, defining the, uh, the definition of space and the idea that, that structural elements could be socketed in one side and bent into place and engineered in a way so that those uh, members don't buckle as you, as you place them. Coming up with systems that um, are far easier at least, on, at least uh, on the onset of the idea to install uh, uh, and, and, and implement. Form and, and height. I, I think that this is a very important a part of what we do. Um, there's some big moves uh, out there. Um, and, and if we look at a couple of major projects that we designed over the years, uh, there's a scale difference. Whether you agree with what's happening in terms of this, I would argue that what's important about this is the urban context and the idea that, that density can be important, can be um, uh, something that we want to, um, to, to further uh, acknowledge and introduce into our projects. So what we're doing though is we're looking at it more holistically. We're looking at structure, architecture, engineering elements, building services and so forth. And what's important to us is that there's an occupied space uh, and, and that space is important from a commercial side. Um, it's important from the point of view of daylighting, um, exposure to solar radiation and so forth. So what we're interested in is, is if we take structure and the form, what are we left with? Um, mechanical systems get imposed on us, and I would argue that we're, 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 we're far too tied with, with the idea of an umbilical cord to our structures, uh, servicing our structures from the ground. And, and one of the advancements that we're very interested in and working on is, is, is structures that have self-generations. So over the height of the building, there are ideas that get implemented that deal with electricity, water, and so forth that, that rely less on that connection to the ground than we do today. Okay, so for something like this, um, we've, we've dissected it. And I'm gonna spend just a minute on this because these lines are a little bit hard to follow. Um, and what I'm gonna point out is a couple of major things. If we look at building height and the gross percentage of gross floor area, this line here is a target. Let's call it the net usable area. Okay, the, the leasable area on the ground floor, this line here, is actually this first curve. And what it says is that as building height increases and with an assumed structural system, an assumed mechanical um, 
mechanical system layout, we find that as the building height increases, the usable space at the base will cross the threshold. So for a building that's 100 and say 25 stories tall, we probably can engineer it today so that we don't cross the 70% threshold until it goes above 125 stories. So all in, we can achieve uh, our goal. Over the height of that building, the average, the average, we look at bottom to top, uh, at 200 stories, it's roughly, uh, it hits the 70% rule. And this is important when we first conceive of projects because they're system dependent, and it's commercial dependent on whether or not the project is going to go forward. Okay. The second point that I like to make is building services. It's a straight line. I know it's not a straight line. It's actually, it varies. But for the purpose of this study, it's roughly 20% of the floor area on any floor as we go up the building. Near the bottom of the building, this line is actually going to be more toward 30% than 20%. Okay. And then finally, the structure. So if we look at the average area for the structure over the height of the building, it might look like this. So it crosses the mechanical services line way up at 350 stories or so. Um, at, the, at the bottom of the building, it crosses it at roughly around uh, 200 stories. These are limiting factors when we look at the effect of structure, the effect of mechanical systems. So why is it important? When we think about these buildings and we add all these things up, uh, we, we, we come up with, in this study, in this, this parametric study, the net floor area that we'd use um, or we'd be able to offer for, for this particular project. So you can, look at, you can look at the effects of separate towers or coupled towers. And what does it mean to structure, mechanical systems, and usable area? And what's important about this is that you can look at other effects like wind effects, vortex shedding, the, the idea of, 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 of the interconnection of, of these forms and what, what it means to allow for air to flow through these forms and very, in a very conceptual way what it means to relative displacements. So we can layer on mechanical systems, uh, uh, elevatoring systems as we know them today um, and we can come up with a study that tells us right away as we plan our cities what the effect is in this case on net area. So the blue is, is areas where we're, we're crossing a defined threshold. In this case it was 75 percent. And we can say to a client, look, if you, if you couple these towers, you come up with an integrated idea of connecting structure together, reduce the surface area, you'll find that your usable area increases. Now, this is one argument. It's one argument for an idea that decouples towers versus uh, couples them together. What's super important on any of this is, 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 is how, do you, how do you calculate the effects on the environment? Uh, what are the things that affect the environment when we build buildings? And there are lots of them. There's material. There's the construction process. Um, there's, there's the effect of long-term investment. And what I would argue what's really important is the life of structures. I mean, many of us when we design buildings, we think that they're going to be there forever. Well, in fact, um, the more we can think about the life of those structures, the more important this type of analysis becomes when we're set out for the design. Because why? If we're able to convince our client and ourselves that our building life is enhanced by advanced ideas for seismic performance, for instance, um, we can do a cost benefit analysis and prove to our client right up front that over 25 years it's going to be worth enhancing that structure today so that, that the long-term effects are minimized. And it's complicated. So this is an, an algorithm that looks at a bunch of different variables. But three of them that's super important are material, construction, and probabilistic damage. This is an estimate of carbon that gets emitted into the atmosphere when we build, in this case, a building that's 20 stories tall and it's made out of steel and it takes an average of four days per story to build it and the service life is 50 years. Our goal, our goal, and all should be for, for all of us, is that 
this is yet another factor in terms of when we design our buildings. So it's not just do I do a steel or concrete building or can I build it faster if it's in steel. We need to think about the effects on the environment at the moment that we build it and what happens with the effects of things like seismic isolation or viscous damping that gets introduced in the structures that helps protect the structure over its life. Disconnection. I, I think we, we can't think about interconnection without this. And, and this comes down to our response to, to, to solutions that, that affect our, our built environment. In areas of high seismicity, the idea of fusing structures is very important. So you can take concrete in this case, and this, this is cast in place concrete, by the way, that you're seeing um, for these, these roof trusses. They're pinned and also fused down the center. So these long wings that you see on either side in a big earthquake can actually pull themselves apart. During a moderate earthquake, they're connected. When they pull themselves apart, the structure is still stable, but the fuse along the center protects the rest of the building. So the idea of decoupling these things are very important. When we think about development, at what moment do we want to separate um, or, or have the ability for those structures, uh, structural elements to be separated? Um, a lot of it's based on, um, I'll, I'll say, uh, verification of theory, and, and it's, sometimes it's pretty crude. Um, and, and in this case, uh, project engineer in our office, Aaron Mazeka, um, I, I didn't believe that this particular mechanism worked. So what we did is we built this, and the idea here is that as the structure moves, if those springs don't elongate, you've attracted no additional force in the diagonals. And what the structure was for is to support a large element within a, lar uh, a building frame. And as soon as we introduced these diagonals, it became what? A braced frame. In high seismicity where you had large movements, you couldn't design those cables to work. So the idea was to create a mechanism. And in that mechanism, it allowed the building to be decoupled at the moment that it needed to and allowed it to move at a time when it was required for large seismic movements in the plane of that wall that you see. So, so these, are, these are responses in, in a way that I think are important um, as we try to protect the material and, 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 and increase the behavior. Um, we can think about our structures not as, as solid elements, but, but, but as elements that have a way to relieve themselves over their height, in this case with wind. And, and if that wind is passing through, the question is, can we capture it? Can we use it at some point uh, to resist load? So what about an idea of airfoils, uh, lift and drag? I mean, similar to what we see on buildings and airplanes and so forth, but the concept is as winds pass through, can we resist oncoming load, in this case overturning, by uplift, uh, lift on, on the foil on the rear, in the rear of this uh, structure, on the back side of the structure? And can we think about this idea of controlling air movement flow by the reduction of diameter that will increase velocity and, and, and with that increase in velocity, increase the energy that's required to turn things like wind turbines? So, you know, it's, it's, it's an idea. It's an idea of, of integrating these structures into their, into their place, into their environment. And during big earthquakes, can we, can we design structures that are initially uh, fixed and then fused and protect the base building uh, when those large forces come? After the earthquake is over, the idea is that the building goes back into service without permanent damage to the base building. Cities are, are filled with, um, I'm going to say, uh, more micro levels in some ways of, of movements, vehicular movements, pedestrian movements, data, power, and so forth. And I really think that as we come up with these ideas, it's all rooted in fundamentals, you know. So, so the idea of structure and force and flow, um, but perhaps the idea of de decoupling 
separating structures from the ground is important at times and, and isolating them in a way that still allows these structures to bear, but as those large lateral forces come, the period of those buildings are softened and protected from, um, from, from, those, from those very swift ground motions. And the result is something that is lightweight. Um, it, it, is, uh, it, it has an opportunity for uh, light to pass into the space um, and also the opportunity to remain operational after a major event. We can think about these structures in a way that deal with uplift and horizontal forces. That butterfly joint that you see down at the bottom is, is a way to deal with multiple loads in multiple directions, including down and up. In the future, as we think about our structures, uh, I think the complete separation is important. The controlled separation between structure and base uh, through, in this case, active means magnetism and, and other techniques that, that can be used. Air, for instance, is, is, another, is another proven technique to actually physically sense and move um, these structures from one another only at certain times. So metabolic systems, what, what is it about our cities that we can look at, diagnose and intervene, um, perhaps, in making corrections to, to them? It, it could be the structures that we're designing today. It could be the structures we're retrofitting uh, in the future. There's a process. There's a, there's, there's, a, there's a way to regulate, and there's a way to instruct. So how, how do we think about these systems uh, going forward? Because there are huge opportunities around the world, in this case, Guangzhou, where everything you see in white is proposed for development, and gray is existing to remain. Uh, these are these are no small moves. These are these are major major um, events that are happening around it, and it's happening in other places. But there are huge opportunities for us to introduce some of these new ideas. I think in terms of the way we design and use our cities. Um, I think it's about sensing the place. It's about fields that could be introduced uh, into the environment that sense oncoming changes in the environment like load, ground motions, winds. And if we're able to understand the magnitude and the direction, then we can respond in a way that's far more efficient than what we do today. We analyze the daylights out of our structures. We look at every single possible load case. We layer on top of those load cases ultimately the worst design condition. If we knew where those forces were coming from, okay, and, and we knew that we have an analysis that's very, very sophisticated that looks at ground motions in many, many directions, but then envelopes it. The structure analysis knows how to respond synthetically to the applied load. So why not connect these structures into a more uh, informative field as they rest after they're designed so that that things perhaps can change within the structure. There could be a state change within the structure. Um, there could be a damping response to a particular load in a particular direction. This has got to uh, result in less material and less effects on the environment. So I think it comes down to these really basic ideas about control. And, 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 and structures are excited. dampens the system. So you wonder if systems should be more about self-reflection. In other words, the idea of oncoming load, the, the understanding of where that load and the response will be, and then there is a response to that load that changes its behavior and creates an effect like that. 
you can take these few systems throughout structures and, and regulate them. So you, you, you can define which joints would slip based on how those joints were clamped. You, in fact, in, in the future, you may even think about the clamping of those joints being affected by uh, outside sources of energy like heat. Heat tends to expand, as everyone knows, material like steel. We talked about shape memory uh, alloys today. You know, what, what effect does it have if, if, if you were to apply heat to some of these joints temporarily and, in fact, loosen the joints rather than kept them tightened and, and then look at the response of the structure? Again, trying to reduce material, increase performance. Rheology. You know, the, the idea of flow is, is very important, and, and I think that we're just starting to scratch at this idea. But, but the opportunity of structures at a larger scale, <coughs> excuse me, a larger scale is really important. But what's really more important is the, is the, is the multi-use opportunity of those structural elements. Exterior wall systems, mechanical systems, we're, we're doing a really bad job of this. I mean, I think that what was talked about today about adaptive skins, hugely important because there is there, there, there is, there's billions of square feet of surface area available to us in the built environment that is just basically there to protect inhabitants, control temperature, but it does nothing more. It just not, does nothing more. And, and if we can capture that and use that in the systems within our buildings in a smart way that, that might be passive, in terms of its response, but it, it, it's, it's something that's, that's, that's interactive and moving uh, throughout the life of the building. So these ideas are starting to come about in small moves perhaps, but um, we should take these, these opportunities of, of, of wall systems that are able to deal with air, which is in terms of insulation is really the best way for us to insulate um, and, and look at air flows and so forth, and then finally look at what it means to uh, integrate structure. Flow of force, very important, of course. Um, and then, you know, the bottom line is the use of the space. And what does it mean to, to inhabit these, these structures? So, uh, again, it's, you know, it, it, they're small moves in many ways. Um, you could argue that, that there are opportunities here that we should work on and look for the future that these perhaps are conduits for, for something other than concrete that gets placed inside of it right now to protect this building from seismic issues. I would argue that it should be, and this is a building I designed, it should be a building, this should be a building that is, is, is much smarter about how we use these, these, these structural elements and, and, and the overall idea of, of the building. Um, so finally, it's about planning and it's about an instantaneous response. So we've developed some ideas that, again, they're sort of in their infant stages. But in looking at form, in this case, form as it associates with the number of floors, looking at geometric changes, so top of the building getting smaller, and what you're seeing in the colors is the effect on the efficiency and the use of the space. It's got an assumed material strength. It's got a demand from seismicity and wind. Mm -hmm. And it has target floor areas, minimum efficiency levels, ideal efficiency levels. And what we can do is we can look at the effects on form, material strengths, geometries, at the same time. Now, this tool gets much more powerful if we look at other things like daylighting, um, the effect of heat gain, the placement of buildings on the site, sun and shadow effects. But all of these are really important as we go forward and, and try to conceive of these projects. I, I think what's important is not the final answer. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a way to, to reason through opportunities but it has to be interpreted. So 
perhaps we can look at all of these at once. Solar effects, the effects of carbon, which we just talked about, material carbon, construction carbon, damage, efficiency, form, structure. And there, you know, there, there are probably 15 others that are super important to the way we design these buildings. Again, it's something to look forward to here as we, as we look at these opportunities around the world. So back to the earth and back to the, the ground. You know, we, we on one hand are very sophisticated. On the other hand, we have um, techniques that are proven, that are important, that, that are they're part of social, um, uh, sort of social interactions and, 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 and part of, I'll say, tradition. And, and this idea of, of building foundations with very primitive techniques that support structures that are super sophisticated is still out there. It's still something that we, we see. So we need to work on both ends in terms of, of, of what we do and what we, we can do. These are proven techniques. Um, I, I'd argue that some of the, the other ideas perhaps are not proven completely yet. Um, so and I think it's about boundary conditions. When we think about our buildings and our cities and how we affect those boundary conditions and how the individual components interact with one another. In this case, what David Nash did was he made adjustments over time uh, to, to change the growth pattern of individual elements then uh, uh, looked at and, and, was, was, and celebrated the, the interaction of, of all the elements. So boundary conditions are really important for us to think about um, in terms of we saw a project today that, that looked at the effect of assembling components that were affected by a boundary, and that boundary can change. Uh, so I, I think that this is a, a fairly well-defined case, but it's important for us to, to think about what the boundary conditions have and, and what the effects are on the sort of growth of our ideas. Um, some uh, of these uh, things exist in nature and, and are very supportive of growth and others are self-destructive. Are, are, are self um, the idea of, of killing the host still exists, so I would argue that our ideas, in fact, could be on one side or the other in terms of our final results. Finally, I think it's about water. I, I think that all of these things that we consider and, and do and we talk about energy for our buildings, I think Ultimately, it's going to be about water and about clean water. Um, this is a resource that I think is going to take over from all other resources as we look forward in developing our cities. Um, so it's an important, very, very important part of, of our conceptual development of, of how we develop these, these designs. So that, that's what I have. Um, thanks for listening, and uh, if you have any comments or questions, I'd be happy to... Yeah, I mean, thank you, thank you for the really, really interesting. Uh, topics that you've covered and and in a sense you ask the question yourself at the end given the aspirations that we have given the some of the technologies that we have and the material system that we have to what extent are we still stuck by the fabrication assembly process which is still medieval in relative terms so what can be done at that level or what should be done at that level to make really the transition uh, take place. Yeah, we, we really are stuck. Uh, I, and I, I'll tell you, we, I am really frustrated on multiple levels because um, in order to um, sort of fully achieve these ideas, we've got to get it built, at least in my view. So um, the construction industry is behind, and I think there are some that are willing to consider changes in how we practice, but they are very slow to come. As a matter of fact, systems that we create 
that need to be vetted, uh, properly vetted by professionals, the time it takes and the, the energy be behind that, that idea of review and implementation is very, very slow. So I think from the design side, I think the closer we can get to the, the construction side in terms of trying to help see what these things would lead to, I think the better uh, we'll all be because there's a, it's a huge uh, step for us to, to take on some of these ideas that in, on the surface seem fairly straightforward um, to do. So yes, we, 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 uh, we're, we're not making a huge amount of progress right now, unfortunately, there. My question is rather boring out of all of these super sophisticated things that you showed, but I'm curious about that um, bottle um, full of air. Um, have you actually built that, and have you compared it with the bubble deck? You know, it's a good, it's a good point. Um, we have not built it in a building yet, although we've got that opportunity in San Francisco. It's actually a second opportunity that, that we have. Um, again, when you talk about science and trying to get across from that idea to implement it, it's about mass production and all those things I talked about. Um, I think we're getting closer to people actually thinking about um, doing this. Um, it's what was mentioned is bubble deck. And bubble deck is, is plastic spheres that, that are placed. As a matter of fact, this idea about using recycled material came from, uh, originated, at least the concept originally from Craig Hartman, who's a, an architect in our office. And he was in South America, and he, it, was, it was the weekend, and he, he sent me an email. I said, Mark, I, I, I don't know. I was, I was just, here's the photograph. They're putting, they're putting balls in the concrete, you know, and I think the thing's going to collapse. I said, no, 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 wait on a second. <laughs> Not going to collapse. I, I said, but, but what's interesting about the problem is, is, is maybe it needs to be more holistic, you know. Can you really take something that is rougher, perhaps, and, and more... Uh, damaging to, to the environment and then place it in a way that's engineered. Um, so that's where that whole thing came from. So it was actually based on this idea of, of, uh, of a more tried and true idea that's out there. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know, who knows exactly where some of that goes in terms of implementation, but it's, it's like any idea, you know, you strike and you, you, you see if it, if it uh, gains momentum and so that's a good, uh, that's a good uh, option. When I first introduced that to our client, that 30-story building, he said, that's great. Okay, we're gonna, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have people in the streets of San Francisco. We're going to gather the water bottles, <laughs> and we're going to assemble them. We're going to have them on site. We're going to wrap them. I mean, I I'm telling you. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's, about a, it's about a way of thinking, I suppose, that we sort of have to, to think about and change as we go forward, you know. Okay, thank you very much for coming.